Simon Peter, give us the rock. The Lord knew that we needed a head, someone who bore his authority. It is interesting that not that far away from us in time, when Our Lady appeared suddenly out of the blue to Bruno Cunacchiona, who intended to assassinate the Pope and was making anti-Catholic moves and lectures, she did indicate to him true church was the Catholic Church and that the Pope was the vicar of her son. Now that is explicit. The unity of the Church to which we refer every time we sing the Creed Unam Sanctam Catholicam et Apostolicam is of a supernatural nature. Wherever one goes in the world, if one enters a Catholic church, one is at home. But it is under threat from all kinds of sinister forces and some of these seem to be operating by infiltration from within. Therefore we need to be doubly careful not to expend energy creating a mode and a mood of division and attack. That has actually increased in our time of the police horror of most unpleasant aggression on the airwaves, in the cybersphere, on screens and phones. It is something very recent in time, this capacity to be unpleasant and not to have to suffer any consequences. One can send nasty messages, always for holy reasons, through the air, and not have to see a face at the other end, all impersonal, somewhat anonymous and unhuman. It is not best way to serve the church. It is not the best way to serve humanity or even our own soul. For every soul that emits a sharp word is also damaging itself. Anything unpleasant that is emitted somehow leaves a bad taste in the soul itself, it becomes responsible for emissions of fumes. When I eventually opted to start going to Holy Mass rather than to the Baptist chapel, there was a feeling of homecoming. It was the security of the centuries and of universality. And that one can always feel when reading books that have come down those centuries from within. We were blessed in France in being taught classically by a very good holy monk who was a walking encyclopedia. 
much of her studies were done still through Latin, that is, the texts, and we were able to feel the power of the centuries and of our own faith, as well explicitly as of our own tradition within the monastic life. One feels part of something greater. Early on, I was given to read the history of our own martyrs, our own fathers, the proto-martyrs of the Reformation in England, the whole story of what happened there under Henry VIII. One was transported in time, and there is that curious event that happened when they saw that things were coming to a head and they wanted to know how to answer and how to handle it. And they went into prayer mode and offered the Mass of the Holy Ghost in the old Carthusian rite in the church of the community in London. Lo and behold, in the course of the celebration, all were taken aback. The heavens were opened and tongues of fire were seen to descend on the community. And they bore witness and the process pain suffered under martyrdom and duress was the consequence indicating to the whole English nation, and indeed to the whole of Europe, that this was the crunch. Alas, the bishops were shy and did not speak out, and England became schismatic first, and then Protestant afterwards. Only one bishop, and he was a holy man already, dared to speak, the Bishop of Rochester, John Fisher. And he was martyred in the same year as a layman, Lord Chancellor of England, Thomas More. Thomas More saw the Carthusians go on the hurdle to Tyburn Hill, the first of a long army, of which the last was our own local Oliver Plunkett, Archbishop of Armagh, primate of all Ireland, as late as 1681. But it was the same problem. The church is one and any bit of compromise, inside or outside, is collusion with the devil. So all our energies must go towards preservation of sacred unity, for Christ is not divided, nor is his truth.